again. I live up here in the far northwest of Scotland, where I run an adventure school. But sometimes, when I want to think a bit, I come up here just a couple of hundred feet up behind the house. It's not really a hill, far less a mountain in the world's scheme of things. But this edition of Wide World is all about men and mountains, and mountains much higher than this one. First, I want to ask you a question. Who said, because it's there? And what mountain? Well, the mountain's easy enough, Everest. But the man, George Lee Mallory. Not long after he made that famous remark, Mallory was last seen less than a thousand feet from the summit and still going up. So was he in fact the first conqueror of Everest? Nearly 30 years before Hillary and Tensing. This question has fascinated many people besides me. The mystery of Everest. on the morning of Sunday, June the 8th, 1924, that George Mallory and his climbing companion, Andrew Irvin, set out to climb the final slopes of the highest mountain in the world. Shortly after midday, they were spotted less than a thousand feet from the top. Then, clouds rolled in and they were never seen again. Now, more than 60 years later, we retrace their route up the mountain and look again at the evidence of climbers and historians to try and unravel what remains one of the greatest mysteries of modern exploration. Could these two men have been the first to reach the top of Everest? The last person to see Mallory and Irvin before they disappeared was the expedition geologist, Noel Adell. In an interview just before he died, he told us that he believed nothing would have stopped Mallory going for the top. I think that uh, when they got to the foot of the final pyramid, it was late. Mallory would say, well, we've got to hurry up here because it's, it's almost approaching dusk. And uh, along we go. I don't think Irvin in any way would have hesitated to go, nor do I think he'd been unfit enough to say, oh no, I don't think we can manage it. I think he'd been perfectly willing to go on, and they might well have got to the top. Captain John Noel, who is now 97, was the official photographer and filmmaker on that 1924 expedition. He believes that Mallory realized that this would probably be his last opportunity to reach the summit. And he felt Mallory was a very determined man. Mallory was, uh, uh, I got the impression that he was uh, absolutely obsessed with the idea of climbing Mount Everest. He'd set his heart on it, he'd thought of nothing, nothing else at all. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, the cut was one of the reasons of his death. Until the first Everest reconnaissance expedition of 1921, no Western explorers had been within 40 miles of the mountain. And in those days, knowledge of high altitude climbing was very limited. No one knew, for example, whether it would be humanly possible to survive on the summit at 29,000 feet without oxygen. You've got to realize one thing about them choosing the members of the expedition. Because we were short of climbers. You see, the First World War killed many of our, the youth of our country. A terrible loss to our country. These expeditions were exploration in the grand style. Hundreds of porters, cooks and donkey men serving a handful of curiously assorted and by modern standards, ill-equipped mountaineers. The Tibetans were amused by this strange cavalcade. But despite this, these were men in the mold of the great Victorian explorers and empire builders, to whom nothing seemed impossible. George Lee Mallory was a vicar's son from Mobberley in Cheshire. 
He was a schoolmaster and lived in Cambridge with his wife and three small children. He had been a contemporary and friend of the poet Rupert Brooke. He was a quiet man, an intellectual, but by 1924 he was the most experienced Himalayan climber of his generation. Andrew Comyn Irvin, Sandy to his friends, was only 22, an engineering student at Merton College, Oxford. He was the star of the university rowing team, tall, blonde and powerfully built. This was to be his first time in the Himalayas, but he had almost no mountaineering experience. Yet on the boat trip to India, Mallory had singled him out as a possible climbing partner. It would, he thought, be a powerful combination of experience and youth. Everest was the chance of a lifetime for young Irvin, but for Mallory, this was his third Everest expedition. And at the age of 37, he knew it was unlikely he would go again. In his last letter to his wife, Ruth, he said, it's 50 to one against us, but we'll have a whack yet and do ourselves proud. All these early expeditions attempted Everest from the north side, from the Tibetan side. In those days, Tibet was open and Nepal was closed. It's a route now returned to by many of the recent expeditions, but it's an exhausting 12-mile approach up the East Rongbuk Glacier before the mountain is even reached. The principal barrier to the upper slopes is the imposing cliff of the North Cull, 1,500 feet of steep snow and ice. Back in 1921, Mallory had climbed to the North Cull at 23,000 feet and had seen a possible route onward to the summit. The following year, he was with another British team which had pushed to 27,300 feet, within striking distance of the summit and far higher than anyone had been before. But that expedition was marred at the very end, when a column of porters Mallory was leading up the North Cull was caught in an avalanche. Seven men died and Mallory held himself responsible for that accident. Now, in 1924, the team once again made the arduous six-week journey from northern India to the mountain. They arrived with high hopes. After all, they'd got very close to the summit in 1922. Mallory wrote to a mountaineering friend, we're going to sail to the top this time and God with us, or stamp to the top with our teeth in the wind. But a month later, it was a different story. Heavy snow and high winds had destroyed the chance of a quick ascent. Two attempts to establish a camp on the North Cull at 23,000 feet had already cost the lives of a porter and a Gurkha climber. And Mallory wrote home to his wife, it's been a bad time altogether. I look back on tremendous effort and exhaustion and dismal looking out of the tent door into a world of snow and vanishing hopes. Hope was vanishing fast. The onset of heavy monsoon snows could be no more than a few days away now, spelling an end to all climbing for the year. Yet there was still enough spirit in the team for one last all-out assault. Mallory wrote, the issue will shortly be decided. The third time we walk up the East Rongbuk Glacier will be the last for better or worse. We've counted our wounded and know roughly how much to strike off the strength of our little army as we plan the next act of battle. We expect no mercy from Everest. In the first attempt on the summit, Mallory and Geoffrey Bruce failed to establish a high camp because their porters insisted on turning back. Two days later, with the camp now in place, Colonel Norton, the expedition leader, with Howard Somerville, traversed across the north face towards the summit. They were climbing without the help of bottled oxygen, and Somerville was forced to give up because of a severe high-altitude cough. Norton went on alone, 
to set a new high altitude record of 28,200 feet. Climbing to this altitude had proved an alarming experience. Somerville had almost died of suffocation in a coughing fit, and Norton had to be carried down in great pain, suffering from snow blindness because he had taken off his goggles. A day or two later, Somerville wrote to the Times, We have no excuse. We have been beaten in a fair fight, beaten by the height of a mountain and by our own shortness of breath. But Mallory was not persuaded. He was determined to make just one more final attempt, and this time he'd do it with oxygen. In fact, he reckoned the two previous attempts had been a waste of effort without it. But the sets used in the 1920s were primitive. They were notoriously unreliable, and each weighed 33 pounds. This is an enormous load at high altitude. But Irvin was an engineer and carried out extensive modifications. He reduced the weight by five pounds and coaxed the best out of the equipment. Nevertheless, he was appalled and wrote home, the oxygen apparatus has already been boggled. They haven't taken my design, but what they have sent is hopeless. Breaks if you touch it. Leaks is ridiculously clumsy and heavy. Out of 90 cylinders, 15 were empty and 24 leaked badly by the time they got to Calcutta. Ye gods, I broke one today taking it out of its packing case. For this last climb, Mallory had selected Irvin as his climbing partner rather than Noel Adele, who might have seemed the logical mountaineering choice because Adele was by far the more experienced climber and just coming to the peak of his fitness. I think Mallory realized that since they were going to try to get a beneficial effect from oxygen apparatus, Irvin had done a lot of the last stages of work on the apparatus they were taking uh, that he I admitted to Mallory that he was the better mechanic myself he'd done an awful lot of work on this apparatus and when uh, Mallory spoke to me about this I said that I was perfectly satisfied and I told him frankly that my interest in the mountain was not only to climb it but also know some of the composition of it and told him about the geology on the morning of June the 6th, Odell took this picture of Mallory and Irving leaving Camp 4 on the North Cull. It's the last picture ever taken of them. Next day, he received a message sent down with a porter to say they'd gone on up to their high camp, just 2,000 feet below the summit. Dear Odell, we're awfully sorry to have left things in such a mess. Our Anna Cooker rolled down the slope at the last moment. Be sure of getting back to four tomorrow in time to evacuate before dark, as I hope to. In the tent, I must have left a compass. For the Lord's sake, rescue it. We're without. To here on 90 atmosphere for the two days, so we'll probably go on two cylinders. But it is a bloody load for climbing. Perfect weather for the job. Yours ever, G. Mallory. On the day of their last ascent, Adele was climbing in support, about half a mile below and behind them. The clouds suddenly cleared above him. He wrote later, I noticed far away on a snow slope leading up to what seemed to me to be the last step but one from the base of the final pyramid, a tiny object moving and approaching the rock step. A second object followed, and then the first climb to the top. As I stood intently watching this dramatic appearance, the scene became enveloped in cloud once more. It was, of course, none other than Mallory and Irvin. An hour after Adele's sighting, in the early afternoon of the summit day, the weather took a turn for the worse. Concern for Mallory's and Irvin's safety Adele climbed alone beyond Camp 6 in a high wind and driving sleet to try and find his friends, but there was no sign. And as instructed by Mallory, he returned to Camp 4 at the North Cull for that night.
Over the next two days, despite feeling exhausted, Adele climbed again on his own to the top camp, but found no trace of Mallory and Irvin. He'd now been above 23,000 feet for 11 days, and his solitary search for the missing climbers, barely a thousand feet below the summit, remains a mountaineering achievement without parallel. It was blowing very hard and blowing, blowing snow and mist and stuff. Was, visibility was bad, very bad. Anyhow, I got back to bivouac uh, tent after looking for them above Camp 6, that's say above 27,000 feet. I got up, I don't know, I got up somewhere between 27 and 28,000 feet and uh, got back there. I signaled by a very primitive means, by means of sleeping bags placed in a certain position on the nearest patch of snow, which I did, indicating couldn't find them and that what we must conclude that they were lost. The expedition leader authorized an answering signal. Abandon hope, come down. There was no point in mounting another search. After four deaths, Colonel Norton was not prepared to take further risks. He felt Mallory's and Irvin's lives had not been wasted, that they had died to keep alive the spirit of adventure that had made the British Empire. He said, we were a sad little party. From the first, we accepted the loss of our comrades in that rational spirit, which all of our generation had learned in the Great War. And there was never a tendency to a morbid harping on the irrevocable. The struggle to reach the highest point on earth had made heroes of Mallory and Irvin, and captured the imagination of a world so recently savaged by war. No one can know for sure whether Mallory and Irvin were the first to reach the summit of Everest. Officially, the honour of first ascent went to Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tensing Norgay in 1953. Yes, when, uh, when I reached the summit of Mount Everest and uh, sort of looked round about, and particularly when I looked down uh, towards the North Col, um, Mallory actually was very much in my mind. And although I really had... Uh, no hope of, of actually seeing any uh, sign of his passing. Um, I certainly looked down towards the North Col. I looked sort of over and down the very steep slopes uh, leading from the summit, and, uh, but I, I saw nothing, no sign uh, of Mallory's passing. The loss of Mallory and Irvin brought the death toll over the first three Everest expeditions to 13. And still, the tantalizing uncertainty remained, had the mountain been climbed. In 1986, an American team went to Everest to examine the clues and the conflicting accounts of Mallory's last climb. The team included Aldry Solkeld, British historian and one of the world's leading authorities on Everest, and Tom Hosell, a Boston engineer who has studied the Everest mystery for 16 years. Together, they've written a book in which Hazel outlines his own controversial theory about what might have happened. What I think happened is that Mallory and Irvin reached the second step, a 50-foot cliff and the only real obstacle in their path, at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. At this time, Mallory had to make a major decision because it was really time to turn back. So he had a brainstorm. He decided to send Irvin down, who was, Irvin was an inexperienced climber. Uh, he, he would take Irvin's oxygen and together with his own, give him just enough to reach the summit, and then Mallory could continue on the risky climb to the top. Remember, this was Mallory's third time to Everest, and certainly would be his last attempt to reach the summit of the highest mountain in the world. They started off, Mallory up and Irvin back to Camp 6, and in about an hour were hit by a snow squall. The snow squall proved too much for Irvin, and he fell to his death. Mallory, on easier ground, continued up. I believe Mallory reached the summit but then he faced a long, arduous descent. It's impossible to say how Mallory died. He may have fallen off the mountain, but I think he may have actually reached the second step and realized it would be impossible to climb down. 
so he decided to sleep out in the open uh, and would have died of exposure. And is it any wonder Mallory, like other climbers of his day, was dressed in a tweed jacket and cotton windsuit? He was already, according to the plan they'd made, four hours late to the last seen. And when four hours late, he was going forward to the t towards the top, not returning back to their last camp. Now on Everest, no human being can stand, survive, without the, the help of his sleeping bag and his tent at that altitude. Their last camp was 27,000 feet above the sea. They had to get back to it that night. They never did. Nobody doubted Mallory's courage or his snowcraft. He was one of the best climbers of his generation, but he had his flaws. A loyal mountaineering friend called him affectionately, a very stout-hearted baby, but quite unfit to be placed in charge of anything, including himself. One of the enduring controversies surrounding Mallory's last climb lies in that brief sighting by Odell. He was only three and a half thousand feet away when he thought he saw them. But did he see men or just rocks? I'm absolutely certain that they were climbers. They were moving, actually, moving figures. It's a mystery which intrigues all mountaineers. Chris Bonington, who has led three expeditions to Everest and reached the summit himself in 1985, readily admits that he's fascinated. I'm practically certain in my own mind that Odell did see the two figures and they were people and they weren't rocks. And I think the reason for this is firstly Odell himself, the fact that he had first-class eyesight, the fact that he was completely at home in that environment, the fact that he, he had a scientist's powers of observation, I mean, the way he was wandering around looking for rocks, the fact that he actually saw the figures moving and specifically said they were moving, which I think means that they couldn't possibly have been two rocks, they were definitely moving figures, and therefore they must have been Mallory and Irvin. It was nine years after the deaths of Mallory and Irvin before another expedition went to Everest, but the mystery was heightened by the only clue they found to the fate of the two climbers. They came across an ice axe, lying on slabs above Camp 6. The puzzling thing was that it was lying considerably lower down the route than the point at which Odell last saw Mallory and Irvin. Hadn't slid down at all, it was lying flat there on these rocks. Well, that was left there, obviously left there, must have been left there. Well, whether left on the way up or the way down has often arisen as a question. Sir Jack Longland, one of the leading climbers a decade later, was on the unsuccessful 1933 Everest expedition which found the axe. This must, must mark the spot where an accident happened. On the grounds that first, nobody in his senses is going to leave an ice axe on Everest, either on the way up or on the way down. It's far too useful in a number of places. More than 40 years passed and nothing else was discovered on the mountain. Then, a rumor reached the West that in 1975, a Chinese climber had stumbled across a body at 26,600 feet on a sloping terrace in the middle of the North Face, directly below the site of that ice axe. It's a report that has never been officially confirmed. Could it be that the Chinese are perhaps unwilling to invite speculation into Mallory and Irvin's climb, because that might cast doubt on their claim to have made the first ascent of the North Ridge? The Chinese climber who found the body in 1975 died on Everest four years later. The day before he died, he revealed his secret to a Japanese mountaineer. And Tom Hosell sums up the evidence about this body. We know that it was an English dead for two reasons. One, the Chinese and Japanese characters are very similar, although the spoken language is not. And uh, Wang actually etched in the snow the words for English dead 8,100 meters and then pointed up on the hill. So there was absolutely no question about it. In addition, the single English word that Wang knew was the word English because all the expeditions prior to the, uh, this one had been English coming in. 
Uh, secondly, they then had a sort of hands and feet description. And, ha and Wang actually went like this to indicate and pointed up to indicate that there was someone sleeping at 8,100 meters. The body appeared to have been found directly below where the ice axe was discovered in 1933. The body has not been sighted since, but it surely must be that of Mallory or Irvin, because they are the only climbers known to have been lost anywhere near the spot. But which one is it? Did Mallory or Irvin, wandering off the route, stop there and later die of exposure? Or did one of them fall to the terrace? Were they on the way up or the way down? Those answers are still unknown. It is not possible without stronger evidence to award the laurels of first ascent to Mallory and Irvin. The honor goes to Ed Hillary and Sherpa Tensing. Theirs became the names that flashed round the world on coronation morning, 1953. If it were discovered that uh, Mallory had in actual fact uh, set foot on the top of Everest, Obviously, it would make some difference to uh, Tenzing and myself. For 33 years, uh, we have been regarded as the heroic figures who, uh, who first uh, reached the summit of Everest. Well, now I guess we'd be just downgraded a little bit uh, to being the, uh, the first two men who reached the summit and actually got safely down again. Uh, which brings up a, a point, of course. Um, if you uh, climb a mountain for the first time, and die on the descent. Uh, is it really a uh, complete uh, first ascent of the mountain? I'm rather inclined uh, to think personally uh, that maybe uh, it's quite important the getting down. Whether they reached the summit or not, it does seem clear that Mallory seriously underestimated the time it would take to reach the top and return to their camp at 27,000 feet. A common error of judgment at high altitude but one that may well have cost them their lives. All climbers understand the dilemma. Close to the summit after a long and exhausting climb, the determination to get to the top can be overwhelming. I'd certainly I'd love to think that they actually reached the summit of Everest. I think it's a, it's a lovely thought, and I think it's something, you know, a gut emotion. Yes, I'd love them to have got there. Whether they did or not, um, I think that's something one, one just cannot know. I think one can say it is perfectly possible they did. And I think the mystery, the question of whether they did or not, I think that's one of the nice things to conjecture about. There was never any doubt among Mallory's loyal friends. Veteran explorer Tom Longstaff, who was with him on the 1922 Everest expedition, wrote about it in a letter to a friend. He was quite certain. It is obvious to any climber that they got up. You cannot expect that pair to weigh the chances of return. I should be weighing them still. It sounds a fair day. Probably they were above those clouds that hid them from Adele. How they must have appreciated that view of half the world. It was worthwhile to them. Now they'll never grow old, and I'm very sure they would not change places with any of us. Well, I agree with Bonington. I have a feeling that for Mallory, at that stage of his life, getting to the top of Everest was everything. And really, the spirit is everything. And I feel he could have made it. Certainly, it's a stirring and splendid story. But the fact remains that the first people to see the summit, take photographs, and come back alive were not Hillary and Tensing. They were the crews of two specially prepared British aircraft in 1933. It was a remarkable expedition and it's their story we're going to see now. One way or another, we're going to reach that summit tonight. <laughs> 